Good morning and welcome to our worship. We call one another to worship with the words on the sheet and hopefully on the screen. Yes, on the screen too. God has called all God's people to lives of hope and service. We long to serve God, but sometimes it is hard. Place your trust in God's power and love. God understands our needs, our sorrows and our joys. Come, let us worship God who is with us always. Praise God for God's eternal presence. Amen. Let's remain standing and sing our opening hymn, Jesus Calls Us O'er the Tumult of Our Life's Wild Restless Sea. Let's come before God in prayer. Let's all pray together. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord God, we rejoice to come and worship you this morning. We rejoice because we are free to come and worship you. We know that many in this world will meet today to worship in secrecy, in fear, disobeying their government to do so, but we meet freely and openly. We thank you that we can meet here, we can see one another, and most of all, we thank you that we can come and praise you. We can come and worship you. We can sing of what our God has done for us. We can can think on the Lord Jesus Christ, As we have sung, he calls us in the busyness, in the distress, and in the triumphs and trials of our lives. That Jesus who calls us is the Jesus who died for us on the cross, who stretched out his hands and said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Lord God, as we come and bow before you this morning, we pray that you may be pleased to accept our worship. Stir up our hearts. Give us the felt presence of your Holy Spirit here with us. 
We long to worship you in sincerity and truth. Help us to put aside the the anxieties, the griefs, the sins, the annoyances, the distractions that trouble our minds and hearts. Help us in this hour to magnify you. Help us as we pray that we might know we do not just utter words into space, but we speak and the living God hears us. Help us as we sing to sing sincerely, knowing and understanding what we say in a spirit of praise and truth. And help us to listen. Help us to listen to your word as it is read to us. Help us to listen to your word as it is explained to us. Help each one of us to be ready to be challenged, to have to question the way we do things, to have to admit we're sometimes wrong, to be ready to go and to serve you more, to love you more, to love each other and serve each other, to know that we have met with our God. Hear our prayers we ask. And now let's pray as the Lord himself taught us. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, welcome to you this morning. Welcome to those of you uh, hearing me in the building. Uh, A special welcome to you if it's your first time with us. But welcome also if you've been here for very many years. Uh, My name's Nigel, and I'm leading the service here this morning. Uh, We were expecting another Nigel to lead the service, but train strikes and train buses mean he's not here. And and, and the rule is, if you have the same name as the person leading, it's your job to do it when they don't turn up. But we'll hear from Nigel later when he leads us in our prayers. Uh, Margaret will be reading for us, and Simon, our minister, will be bringing God's word to us later in the service. Welcome to you if you're online as well. Uh, We have many people who join in and follow us online, including Nigel this morning, and we have others who catch up online throughout the week. Whenever we meet and worship together, it's worship to our God, and we're part of that worldwide church meeting and worshipping God today. Uh, Just one notice this week, we have um, an online uh, art group uh, meeting on Wednesday the 28th, and on Wednesday, the 13th of March, this is working through the uh, art in scripture and looking at that, we've done this before, and this is going to be hosted by the online group. If you want details about that, get the newsletter. If you don't get the newsletter, see me or see Libby and we'll get you put on a list and you can have the details uh, for that meeting. So that's Wednesday, the 28th and Wednesday, the 13th of March. And now let's... Oh, Philip has a notice. All right, organ concert on Saturday. Which Saturday? This coming Saturday, which is the... I can't work the dates out. This coming Saturday, there is an organ concert at 4pm. It's the 24th, thank you, sorry. So, organ concert this coming Saturday, that's at 4pm, followed by a buffet. Uh, Do come along and and listen to that. They're always very good performances, and we we enjoy a good turnout at those. So now again, let's come and bring our prayers to God in thanks for the, the, the giving of God's people here in this church. Lord God, all that we have comes from you. All we owe all we have to you, 
And as we bring our offerings, both of time and money and talents and prayers to you, we pray that you might use these things for the building up of your kingdom. We pray you'll give wisdom to those who decide how to use these resources. And we pray that we might indeed have an impact on the community around us, that we might provoke faith in the heart of this city in which we live. Hear our prayer. Amen. And we now have an anthem from the choir. I, I was very witty this morning and said this anthem is too long because the anthem, in fact, is, is based on the hymn tune, Too Long. But my, my wit was lost on Philip, who didn't recognise the hymn tune. But there we go. So we now have an anthem. It's Turn Back, O Man. And then after that, Margaret will come and bring our first reading to us.
first reading this morning is from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. Jesus and his disciples left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they didn't understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. song is a, a song we've sung before. It's a Taze song, and it's, it requires a little explanation. So um, basically, the, the words in the italic on, on the slides and in the booklet, wait for the Lord whose day is near, wait for the Lord, keep watch, take heart. That, as it was, is a chorus, and we're to sing that round and round again, I think about ten times, maybe more. And so keep singing that, and then every now and again, other words, which you see on the slide, are going to be sung by our, our, our choir, sort of over and above what we're doing. But don't be distracted, don't be put off, just keep on waiting for the Lord, okay?
The second reading this morning is from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for, a, for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, we've left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields and with them persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Thank you, Margaret, for reading to us. And now Simon is going to come and uh, preach to us. Let's all have ears and hearts to hear. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. I don't know if you ever play that game where you uh, try and write parables. Um, maybe it's just me. Uh, I, I, there's one that's been running around in my head for a little while, and it's called The Parable of Queuing to Get on an Aeroplane. Um, it's based on real experience. You know when they call people to the gate and all the people who've paid for speedy boarding go straight to the gate and you're stuck at the back of the queue if you haven't paid for that. And then you discover that there's a bus to take you to the aeroplane. So all the people with the speedy boarding are first on the bus and you're last on the bus. But then you're first off the bus and first onto the aeroplane and they're last onto the aeroplane. Many who are first will be last and the last will be first. It's not a terribly profound parable. But it raises this question of the great reversal, the idea that things are not the way that they appear to be. And we're back to a theme from last week's sermon there. Um, apparently, despite a million internet memes to the contrary, Mahatma Gandhi actually didn't say that the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. But if we're thinking about who are the first and who are the last, who are the greatest and who are the least, what it is to reverse those, uh, those poles. Uh, the quote doesn't have to be from Gandhi to still have a valid point. The true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. And I do find myself, as we enter what is probably uh, an election year nationally, certainly an election year here in London, I find myself worrying that the current trajectory of British society 
is ever towards the promotion of self-advancement, the self-improvement of the already capable, at the expense of those whose capacity to achieve is more restricted. And I suspect that the rhetoric in the local and national elections this year will laud people who are in so-called hard-working families, whilst vilifying those who are deemed to be benefits scroungers. The changes to the benefits system in recent years have left many vulnerable people without proper access to support and a significant part of what I do behind the scenes each week is spent with people who are vulnerable, helping them fill out online forms so that they can access benefits that they're entitled to but where the barrier to accessing them is just too high. So I speak from some experience to try to help people on this. A National Audit Office survey found that a significant number of suicides are linked to problems with benefit claims. People who just, they get sanctioned, they can't access the benefits they're due to, and life gets too much, and depression takes its hold in a big way. Dr Chris Allen, a consultant clinical psychologist with the Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust, has written, when worth is increasingly defined by ability to be economically productive and mental health issues are discounted as a reason to not be in the workforce, the underlying message is that you're a burden and that you don't belong. He continues, a compassionate society would care for people experiencing difficulty. Recognise that all contributions can be made outside work and facilitate this, rather than communicate a sense that if you cannot work, you may as well be on the scrap heap or even not here at all. To take this train a bit of thought further before we circle back to our scripture reading, in our society, even caring for the victim or siding with the weak is somehow viewed as a somehow suspect endeavour. A headline from the Daily Mail a few years ago was, Nobody Likes a Do-Gooder. And it said that selfless behaviour is alienating. The unnamed Daily Mail reporter, I'm not surprised they didn't put their name to it, explained, they probably think their selfless behaviour makes them popular, but the truth is about do-gooders that nobody really likes them. Far better, clearly, at least in the Daily Mail's eyes, to get on and get ahead, whilst those who fall behind, as Johnny Depp says in Pirates of the Caribbean, get left behind. Well, in our first reading this morning from Mark's Gospel, we met the disciples having an argument about which one of them was the greatest. And in response to their quarrel, Jesus offered the most powerful and challenging revisioning of human power dynamics that I think has ever been uttered. Verse 35, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And this week, as we begin that period in the Christian calendar known as Lent, when people focus on self-denial as a preparation for their journey towards the cross, the invitation here is for us to join with the early disciples in rethinking the basis of our self-worth and in reconsidering where we will place our priorities. Some of you on Ash Wednesday may have attended a service of ashing. We had one here at Bloomsbury, um, hosted by MCCNL, our evening congregation, and I know a couple of people from the church were at that with them. I was down at King's College London Chapel uh, on Wednesday lunchtime, um, imposing ashes on students and staff there, uh, using the words, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We all need to be saved from getting ideas above our stations, friends. And the disciples in Mark's Gospel, quarrelling about who was the greatest, were stuck in a mindset of personal and individual advancement, with delusions of grandeur and achievement dominating their self-worth. I'm a huge fan of the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, and the lyrics of one of the songs brilliantly captures something of this hubris on the part of the disciples in our reading today. Uh, you've got the disciples um, sort of sitting around drinking a glass of wine or something, and uh, they sing, 
always hoped that I'd be an apostle, knew that I could make it if I tried. Then when we retire, we can write the Gospels so they'll still talk about us when we've died. I mean, I could, I could unpick that from a historical critical point of view in terms of who writes the Gospels and all that, but that's not really the point. The point is uh, that this captures a culture of personal advancement and spiritual achievement, which is still something which haunts disciples of Jesus in our own time. Many of us have been nurtured in our faith in contexts which emphasized the following of Jesus as a personal decision that each of us must make for ourselves. I remember uh, services fairly regularly in my home church when I was growing up where the minister would, you know, he'd ask everybody in the congregation to bow their heads and then he would encourage people who wanted to make a personal commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ to look up and, and meet his eye and of course you're down there and, you're, and you suddenly hear him going, bless you, thank you. Yes, bless, bless you, thank you. And because uh, I was a, a good kid and had my head down, I, it did just cross my mind, is he making that up? Is he just saying that to kind of prime the pump a little bit? But, you know, I don't know, maybe that's unfair. He's dead now, so there's no way of knowing. Um, but, you know, this kind of personal, personal commitment mindset of faith, I, I mean, I don't fundamentally disagree with it. There is always an element of personal choice involved. Of course there is. It can but it can all too quickly take us to an individualized understanding of the gospel where the good news is good news for me and where what matters most is my personal relationship with Jesus. Many of the songs we sing speak of Jesus in highly personalized language. Some of our favorites, my Jesus, my savior. When we had last week, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. O Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder. And, you know, I like and choose all of these songs. So I'm I'm not knocking stuff I don't like here. But we do need to be alert to the temptation of falling into an overly individualized gospel. Because that temptation to pride is always before us when we do. It's only a short step, you see, from knowing that I am special to God to thinking that maybe I'm somehow more special than others or possibly more worthy of God's love than some others might be. And that is the great lie. The great lie is that one human life is somehow worth more than another. There's a wonderful quote from C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters. Uh, one of the pride and joys of my, book, of my library, my bookshelves, is that I have a first edition of the Screwtape Letters. And you get um, senior demon Screwtape writing to his uh, nephew, um, demon Wormwood, offering this junior demon some advice on how to tempt his first human subject. And Screwtape says to his nephew about uh, the person he's tempting, he calls him his patient. He says, your patient has become humble, but have you drawn their attention to this fact? All virtues are less formidable to us once a person is aware they have them, but this is especially true of humility. Catch your patient at the moment where they're really poor in spirit and struggle into their, uh, smuggle into their mind the gratifying reflection, by Jove, I'm being humble. And almost immediately pride, pride at their own humility will appear. If they awake to the danger and try to smother this new form of pride, make them proud of this attempt and so on through as many stages as you please. But don't try it for too long unless you wake their sense of humor and proportion, in which case they'll just laugh at you and go to bed. We just need sometimes to laugh at ourselves. Let's not take ourselves too seriously. And so we're back to those disciples taking themselves far too seriously, arguing about who was the greatest And what they needed to learn from Jesus was that he was calling them to be part of a very different kind of community, where greatness and humility were measured in substantively different ways. And Jesus teaches this through a kind of 
enacted parable involving a small child. It's a highly dramatized scene and Jesus draws the, the little child into the center of the group. I've mentioned before, it's always worth paying attention in Mark's gospel to the geographical clues that he gives us about where things take place. And the setting here is in the midst of a group of people in a house in the town of Capernaum. This isn't happening on some isolated hillside somewhere. It's taking place right at the center of community and family life. And the thing is, Normally, a child would have been uh, emphatically excluded from such a setting. Uh, uh, we know the Victorian mantra that you know, children should be seen but not heard. But I'm afraid in first century Capernaum, children should be neither seen nor heard when the adults are gathering. Children and other powerless members of society would never have been welcomed into the center of a social circle. They would have been kept outside unseen and unheard. In fact, more sinister than this, the normal pretext for drawing a powerless person into the middle of a circle would have been as a precursor to stoning them. Let's never forget that the scapegoating of the vulnerable isn't something that we only find in the eye of the Daily Mail and its ilk. All human societies can end up scapegoating the vulnerable. But Jesus draws the child into the center. He subverts all of these power structures that exist to control and exclude. He draws a small, weak, powerless child into the center of the circle, and he takes the child in his arms and embraces it with love and welcome and inclusion and acceptance. The most powerful person in the place honors the least powerful and least deserving. And as object lessons go, this one packs something of a punch, particularly given that it is Jesus's answer to the argument about which of the disciples is the greatest. Jesus says to them, and by extension to us, that the greatest is the weakest, and that the last shall be first. And I wonder how we can hear this challenge in our world, in our context, in our church. Who has power in this room? And who doesn't? This is a question we were considering in our meeting earlier in January uh, after lunch, as some of us were at a meeting talking about that. Who has power in this room? It's obvious I've got some, isn't it? I've got the microphone. But who doesn't? Who's invisible? Who's unheard? Who's unseen? And then allied to that, where do we locate our estimation of value? You see, the community of Jesus' disciples, both then and now, is to be a place where the weak and the vulnerable are valued, where the helpless are nurtured, and where personal prowess is secondary to the service of others. This is a topsy-turvy view of power dynamics, where those whom society would normally sideline or scapegoat are brought into the center and are honored and valued. But here's the thing, Jesus doesn't welcome the child and tell his disciples to do likewise just because it's a nice thing to do. Or to earn approval from God and society, or to make himself and the disciples feel like better people, or to enact some kind of first century equivalence to politicians kissing babies on the campaign trail. Or even to set up a community of do-gooders who make the rest of the world feel guilty and resentful for their do-gooding. Although I have to note, Christians have a pretty poor track record of doing all of these things with enthusiasm. But rather the Jesus community, which is you and me in our generation, is instructed to do good to the weak and the powerful. Sorry, to do good to the weak and the powerless. Because this is the antidote to the envy 
and jealousy and greed and resentment that keep some down in the gutter whilst raising others to the stars. In the first century society, just as today, so much of societal advancement was built on some achieving greatness while others were trampled along the way. And if you look around you today and you see a society creaking at the seams with a rising number of vulnerable people falling through the cracks and you find yourself thinking there has to be a better way, well then the good news is that there is. And it is here in this enacted parable of Jesus bringing a little child into the heart of the community. Jesus invites his followers to create communities where the rich and the powerful and the educated and the articulate set aside their privilege and advantage. Learning that these, in the end, do not add to a person's worth before God. Jesus invites his followers instead to become communities where the vulnerable and the excluded are welcomed in and placed in positions of honour, as their worth is restored to them in God's name. As the rich man in our second reading discovered, it would be so much easier if it was just a matter of keeping some basic commandments. Here we have a guy who seems on the surface to be getting it all right. He's not killing people. He's not cheating on his wife. He's not stealing or lying or defrauding. And he's still doing very nicely too. Thank you very much. This is the kind of guy who is, as some might put it today in a nauseating post on social media, hashtag winning at life. But he knows that something isn't ringing true. And that despite all his success and all of his efforts to be good, his life still lacks vitality. It's missing that deeper significance. The thing that Jesus calls life eternal. And Jesus offers him a prescription for what ails him, which is that he needs to let go of his money. This is not easy for us to hear in London in 2024, where almost all of us are richer than two-thirds of the world's population. Challenges about money are never easy to hear. They're certainly not easy to deliver. <laughs> and invitations to give it all away are problematic. Thankfully, Jesus knows this. He says that it is hard for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, and that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And I've heard people engage in all kinds of exegetical squirming to get out of this. One of the most commonly asserted get-outs in the armory of well-heeled preachers is that there was an eye of a needle gate in the wall in Jerusalem which was narrow and low and the only way a camel could get through it would be on its knees concluding of course that the way a rich person gets into the kingdom of God is on their knees in prayer. The only problem with this is there's absolutely no indication that such a gate ever existed. It's just a completely invented get out story. Others have claimed a misspelling and that instead of camelos it should be the similar sounding camelos, which would mean rope or cable. But again, there's no textual variation, I'm afraid, to support this. Putting my biblical studies scholar hat on for a moment. The problem is that there isn't really any way out of the fact that Jesus basically says it's impossible for those who have wealth to find their way into God's kingdom on merit. And speaking as someone with, in global terms, a certain level of wealth, I don't know why any of us are surprised about this. Those of us who have bank accounts and savings and pensions and houses will know from our own experience that these things can weigh heavy on our souls. The temptations to selfishness, to greed, to pride, to envy, to gluttony, 
and to laziness, all of those temptations are just amplified when we have wealth and by the privilege and power that comes with it. It's just true. I know it's to be true in myself, and I suspect many of you do too. None of us can resist these temptations on our own. For some, the corrosive effect of wealth on their spiritual souls may indeed mean that the call of Jesus is to give it away. Certainly for this young man who had inherited vast wealth, that was where he had got to in his spiritual journey. But I don't think it is responsible exegesis here to take the encounter between Jesus and the rich young man and to extrapolate from there to an ideology where all of us just need to give everything away. I do not think that that's where this takes us. Any more than it would be responsible exegesis to suggest that the young man was rich in the first place because God had rewarded him with wealth in return for his diligence in keeping the commandments, as some prosperity gospel preachers have suggested. Rather, I think the message for each of us to hear in London in 2024 in a congregation of people who, between us, hold a reasonable amount of money, if we're honest about it. I think the message we need to hear is a challenge about our attitude towards our possessions, a question about the extent to which they influence and determine our sense of ourselves, and a demand that we reject any patterns of worth and value written on to human beings that are based on their money, power, and status. My friends, you may have money and you may have a house. I have money. I have a house. That does not make me a better person than the person who doesn't, in God's eyes. And we must resist any thought that it does, because it will eat away at our souls. There is also a challenge here, I think, about we handle our giving and the attitude with which we give. I've said many times before that giving to God through the people of God is not the same thing as giving to a charity that we want to support. And nor should it be one of the good works that we do to assuage our consciences and discipline our wallets. Our giving to God should be a sacrificial offering where we surrender to the people of God so that together we can discern what God would have this community do to bring the kingdom of God into being in and through this place. So I do not preach tithing as something that is binding on all Christians, and arguments about pre-tax or post-tax tithing that you hear sometimes seem to me to be entirely misplaced. You all know if your giving is sacrificial or not. For what it's worth, though, through my life, I've found that a starting point of giving 10% of my disposable income to God through my church has been a good discipline to remind me that I do not truly own that which I have and that I don't want to get into a situation where what I have owns me. For those of us with money, this is a difficult calling, but it's not impossible, at least not for God, because Jesus reminds the disciples, for humans... This is impossible, but for God, all things are possible. I also think it's worth our while pay, paying attention, whilst we're here, to the language that Jesus uses to uh, describe, to speak of um, the kingdom of God in his response to the rich man's question about what he must do to inherit eternal life. We've got these terms, kingdom of God, eternal life. These can sometimes be conflated with the idea of heaven as the place where souls go after death if they have been deemed good enough. Within the cosmology of ancient Judaism, the first century world, the heavens, the spiritual heavens, were literally up there as the place where the birds flew 
and the clouds gathered. They believed that God lived up there, above the sky, seated on a throne with his heavenly hosts around him. I mean, we still use this language a little bit, don't we? You know, you talk about going out on a clear night and with there's no light pollution and you admire the starry heavens. That's where that language comes from. Uh, the ancient people believed that if you could find a tall enough mountain, or maybe if you could jump high enough, you could, at least in theory, get there yourself. And in the apocalyptic tradition of Judaism, they imagined the heavens and described going up there on mystical visions to gain otherworldly knowledge before coming back down to earth and imparting that knowledge to others. And the idea of heaven being where you go when you die is only a very late addition to the Jewish theology of the afterlife. Many Jews at the time of Jesus wouldn't have believed this at all. So when Jesus says that it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven, and when a rich man asks what he must do to inherit eternal life, the issue that's under discussion here is not the question of whether the rich person goes to heaven or hell when they die for reward or punishment. That's just not what's on the table here. This is a discussion about how people should be living in the present, in the here and now. It's a discussion about living life in such a way that life's quality of life, that the essence of who we are has eternal value. It's about living in such a way now that God's kingdom is made manifest and known through our lives and our community. So the kingdom of heaven, the life eternal that they are yearning for, is not some afterlife. It's actually, it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven means it's kind of hard for those who are weighed down in this life by the burdens of money and possessions that they carry. It can be hard for them to embody and live God's kingdom into being in the here and now in such a way that the great reversal happens, that the poor are raised up and the mighty are laid low, as Mary puts it in the Magnificat. If we can start to model in our midst the systematic reversal of the world's consensus about where power and prestige and status lie, if we can start to live into being a community where the value assigned to a life is not based on their achievement or their wealth or some other metric of their greatness, but on the inherent value of each created being, then we are at least part of the way towards the fulfillment of that for which we pray every Sunday, that the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven. But valuing the weak and the powerless is only part of the story. Raising up others is not in itself enough. There are many charities that do both these things brilliantly. And they are part of the way to seeing the kingdom of God come. You see, we also have to take a long and considered look at our own values, our addictions to money, power, and status, our sense of our own self-worth and self-importance. And we, too, have to learn for ourselves and not just for others that the value of a life is measured only in terms of God's love. All the other foundations and walls that we have used to define our sense of self are more of a hindrance than a help to our journey into God's love. The reason Jesus welcomed a child into the midst of the disciples is because a child does not or should not need to earn the value and love of their parent a child should never have to earn love. To make them do so is abusive, is it not? A baby is loved for who it is, not for what it does. And the move towards conditional love that many of us have experienced 
is, I think, a move away from God's absolute acceptance and delight in our being. Many of us have forgotten that we're loved for who we are. Many of us have forgotten that we are loved for who we are. And we have taken deep into ourselves the destructive lesson that what we do, what we have, what we achieve is the precursor to being loved. We convince ourselves that God and others will only respect or admire us for our possessions or some other metric of our greatness. And we confuse this with God's love. And God's love is never conditional upon anything. You are deeply and absolutely loved by God. The danger is for us that we become the rich young man, keeping the commandments to earn God's love, but discovering this creates a successful exterior with a hollow center. And the challenge to us as we enter this season of Lenten discipline is, I think, the same as it was to him. Can we give up our addictions to money, power, and status? Can we give away our false estimations of our value? Can we move beyond striving to be good into a place where goodness flows from us? Not because of the good we endeavor to achieve in the world, but because we have learned to place the weak and the vulnerable at the center of our value system. As Jesus says, many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Let's uh, take a moment to pause and think about what Simon has said to us and how that needs to affect each one of us. We respond by singing the hymn, Spirit of Jesus, if I love my neighbor out of my knowledge, leisure, power, or wealth, help me to understand the shame and anger of helplessness that hates my power to help. Uh, the tune perhaps is not that well known, so Philip's going to play it through once for us, and then please do a stand and sing.
Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Nigel Williams is languishing in darkest Hertfordshire, stricken by the vicissitudes of railway. Bora da, Nigel. Good afternoon, Very good. Good afternoon, everybody. We gather in prayer to bring our loving God, our concerns to the world, the church, and ourselves. We are reminded in the book of James to pray for those suffering, the sick, and the sinful. Look, looking to love and compassion. Let us pray. Let us remember that our world is torn by war, famine, and disease. Loving God, we pray for you to act in our world to bring peace to the work of peacemakers and peacekeepers, to aid workers and aid givers, for doctors and for medical staff. We pray for governments and nations to see peace and the welfare of individuals. We pray for this in the Sudan, in Somalia, in Syria, Yemen, in Ukraine, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, Central African Republic, Israel and Gaza. We pray for the ceasefire in all these regions. We pray for the nations facing elections this year. We pray for godly and goodly politicians that will lead and direct these nations to value all people and the planet we depend on. We pray for those nations facing food insecurity because of climate change and conflict. We pray for aid and help for a fairer world Help us with nations to show love and build up treasure in heaven. We pray for the church and other faiths to feed, clothe, shelter, and heal those in need. We pray for our church and our commitment to the night shelter. We thank you for the work of NCC and the volunteers here the volunteers in Westminster and the volunteers in London providing shelter for the homeless. We pray for Simon as he leads us and the deacons as they direct us under the work of your spirit. We pray for Liz as she supports Simon in the task of ministry and carrying out her own work. We'll now spend some time silently remembering the needs of the church naming those sick, the suffering, and those in need. Help us as a fellowship to offer love and finance where we can to build treasure in heaven. We pray for the individuals around us. Help us to receive love and offer love for the sake of the good news for all. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Nigel. I, I fear it's not just the railway links that are somewhat troubled this morning, but uh, hopefully we, we heard most of those prayers and... We can heartily say our men to that. Uh, at the end of the service, uh, please do join us for tea and coffee. Um, feel free to bring them in here. Let's all get to know one another and chat over, over tea and coffee at the end of the service. Uh, but before then, let's join together in the singing of our last hymn. Jesus meets us at the margins, calls us in to take our place where the outcast and the singer share a feast of love and grace.
May the God who gives us peace make us holy in every way. May God keep our whole being, spirit, soul and body, free from every fault at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.